message for Mother's Day. In Ecclesiasticus chapter 3 verses 4 and 6. And he that honors his mother is as one that lays up treasure. He that is obedient unto the Lord will be a comfort to his mother. What greater treasure can we gather than God's blessing? We can understand blessing to mean God's loving care. Blessing is synonymous with God's saving and healing activity. Mothers are one of God's special helpers through whom we experience His loving care. What can we do with such treasure from our Heavenly Father? Be obedient to the Lord out of love for Him. Show how much we love God by the way we love each other. Comfort, yes, comfort my people, says your God in Isaiah 40. We show how much we love God when we love and are a comfort to our mothers.
In the name of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Almighty and sovereign God, and loving, kind, heavenly Father, we joyfully come into your house on this Sunday morning. We are thankful that you have drawn us here. And for those who are unable to come into your house, they are able to be with us electronically, a miracle for which we thank you. It is a special day that we celebrate in this country and in many other countries. It is Mother's Day. And first of all, Heavenly Father, we give thanks to you for our natural mothers. We're thankful for them, for what they have done for us and are doing. We also recognize that we live in an imperfect world and not every mother-child relationship is how you want it to be. And we pray also 
that those circumstances can be made right, that there can be reconciliation and peace. We also thank you for the church, which is also considered our mother. We're thankful that we have it. We're long, longing for the times when we can be together again. Heavenly Father, the church is a place where we can come and we can worship you, bring our thanksgiving and our praise to you. The church is also a place where we can come and have access to salvation. We're thankful, Father, that your Son created his church and we want to make the most of it Heavenly Father, you've called us here because you want to teach us. Let us be open to what you have to say and let it come into us and then become a part of us so that it changes the way we are and it changes what we do and even our thinking and our speaking. Heavenly Father, you know the circumstances of this congregation that will listen and watch this service today. Father, provide for them. You know their hearts. You know their concerns. Please provide comfort and strength, a way out of the circumstances they are in, if that is possible, but strength and wisdom to endure and handle them properly where an escape is not possible. Heavenly Father, we also thank you for the apostolate and we want to be one with that ministry. Heavenly Father, also we know that this morning we will hear the words of absolution and we thank you that you will for, you forgive our sins and tell us that you have those sins from which we have repented. Now, Father, please bless us beyond what we could pray. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. So good morning to you, brothers and sisters, and to mothers, I wish you a very blessed Mother's Day. Our Bible verse this morning, continuing the theme of the power of God, comes from the Psalms, the 62nd Psalm, verses five and six. My soul, Wait silently for God alone, for my expectation is from him. He only is my rock and my salvation. He is my defense. I shall not be moved. <laughs> How many times, brothers and sisters, do we begin a sentence with the words, I hope? Hope is so important to us as human beings. The Apostle Paul, in writing in 1 Corinthians, he talks about faith, he talks about love, and he talks about hope. But there are different levels of hope. There is human hope, the hope that we speak of in everyday life. Like, I hope, perhaps students say, I hope I'm going to get a good grade on my exam. Perhaps those who are graduating this year say, I hope that I'm going to be able to find a job. We hope. And in some cases, our hope is nothing more than wishful thinking. That's hope when we talk about it in an everyday way. 
But then there's another kind of hope, and that's called Christian hope. And a Christian hope is a higher hope. Because a Christian hope recognizes that the things that we hope for, if they are according to God's will, they will happen. Because God is powerful enough to make them happen. He is the almighty God. And nothing can stop him from doing what he wants to do. And that is a higher hope than just the hope of everyday language. But then there's an even higher level of hope. And that is a hope that's based upon the promises that God has made. And when God has made a promise, we can have a hope, a confident expectation that God will fulfill that promise. Because God has made the promise, and God can't lie. God has made the promise, it is his will to do it. God has made the promise, and it is within his, within his power to fulfill the promise that he's made. And that, brothers and sisters, is the highest form of Christian hope, that we can have the confident expectation that God will fulfill the promises that he has made. That's why the psalmist David, according to this Bible, a psalm of David, my expectation is from him. Other translations say my hope is in him. The confident expectation that God will fulfill the promises he's made. And where does our hope have its beginning? It comes from the first part of this Bible verse. My soul waits silently for God alone. There was a Baptist minister, I think, who said, if God can't keep you from, or, or if Satan can't keep you from evil, he'll keep you busy. Too busy to engage the Lord. My soul waits silently for God alone. There was a prophet in the Old Testament, Elijah, and he had been through some very difficult times. He had stood up against the 450 prophets of Baal, I think it was. He had wound up killing them all. He was on the run from Jezebel. He wanted to die, but he didn't want to die from, from Queen Jezebel. He wanted to die at the hand of the Lord. The Lord took him a great distance. The Lord fed him. The Lord then took him for 40 days and 40 nights until he got to Mount Horeb. He was in a cave at Horeb just wanting to die. And then the Lord came to him and said, go to the top of the mountain. And the Lord was going to reveal himself to him. And there was a great wind, but the Lord wasn't in the wind. And then there was a great earthquake, and the Lord wasn't in the earthquake. And then there was a great fire, and the Lord wasn't in the fire. All of these spectacular things that you would think would command the attention, would be evidence of God, and it wasn't. And then finally, there came a still, small voice. And that was the voice of God. And that voice provided comfort and strength to Elijah and reminded him that he wasn't alone, that there were still 7,000 faithful souls who had not yet bowed down to the prophet Baal. That's where it begins for us, brothers and sisters, that we allow the Lord to speak. My soul wait silently for God alone. The prophet Elijah had to wait a long time for the Lord's voice to come to be. But it came. For my expectation 
is from him. My hope is in him. It's like 30 years ago. There was a vice presidential debate in this country. And one of the candidates for the office was unknown. And he began his introduction by saying, who am I and why am I here? Brothers and sisters, have you ever asked yourself, why am I here? Why am I on earth? Why did God give me life? What is my purpose in life? The main objective of our life is to live in harmony with God. Have you ever thought about it that way? Our main objective in life is to live in harmony with God. After all, God created us for that very, very purpose. He wanted to have harmony. He wanted to have fellowship with us. He wanted to be together with us. He wanted to love us, and he wants us to love him. That's the purpose of our life. That's the goal. That's the objective of our life, to live in harmony in him with him. And who is better equipped to tell us and to teach us how to live in for harmony with him than the almighty God himself? Oftentimes, we as human beings, we buy a product and it comes in a nice box and we open the box and there we'll see some instructions. And there's two kinds of people. There's the kind of people that look at those book, that little book of instructions and say, there it goes, and then there's another look of, a group of people that look at that book of instructions and read every single line. Brothers and sisters, who do you think is best equipped to, to tell us how to live a life of harmony with God? The Lord Jesus Christ said, I come to give you life and life more abundantly. What does he want to give us? He wants to give us everlasting life in untroubled fellowship with him and with all of those he has chosen to be there with us. That's what we're, our goal of life is. That is what our hope is. That is the reason that the Lord Jesus Christ came. That is why the Lord Jesus sacrificed his life. That is why the Lord resur God resurrected him and gave him a glorified body. That is why the Lord Jesus Christ established his church. That's why he gave the apostle ministry to the church. That's why we have the sacraments of rebirth that the Holy Spirit is involved in and regenerates us and makes us a new creation in Christ so that we can fulfill the purpose for which we have been created, to live in harmony and peace with God. And he wants that to begin already now. But is that our objective in life? To live in harmony with God? It's Mother's Day, so I'll tell a Mother's Day story. I was having a conversation with my mom. I was getting, to, getting ready to go into middle school or junior high at the time. And my life was going to change because school was going to be far different than it had been before. And even though this took place in August, my stomach was already in knots because I was worried about what was going to happen. And two things concerned me more than anything else. And they probably don't exist in many schools today. The one first one was physical education because we had a, there was a gym teacher there, a phys ed teacher there, who had a reputation spread throughout the district about how mean and nasty and tough he was. And my other concern was what they called shop class, where you had to make things out of wood and metal and things like that, and I have two, th two left thumbs and I can't make anything at all. And I was worried about those things. Like I said, I had knots in my stomach and I told my mom about it and she said, I'm not worried about that at all. 
And for a minute I thought, wow, that's a little harsh. I just poured out my heart to you. But then I realized it took me a long time, but I figured it out. My mom knew that my future didn't lie in doing well in sports or doing well in shop class. She knew me, and she knew my future wasn't going to be an athlete, and she knew my future wasn't going to be, I wasn't going to make my livelihood working with my hands. And she was right. The Almighty God, He knows us. He created us. I'd like to just read a psalm, some, some verses from the psalm, the 33rd psalm from the New Living Translation, starting with the fourth verse, but then skipping throughout the psalm because it's too long to read in its entirety. For the word of the Lord holds true, and we can trust everything he does. The Lord looks down from heaven and sees the whole human race. From his throne he observes all who live on the earth. He made their hearts so he understands everything that they do. But the Lord watches over those who fear him, those who rely on his unfailing love. We put our hope in the Lord. He is our help and our shield. In him our hearts rejoice, for we trust in his holy name. Let your unfailing love surround us, Lord, for our hope is in you alone. The Lord created our hearts. He understands everything we do. He understands every experience we go through. He understands every hardship. He understands every trial. He understands the battles that we're doing against our old nature. The fight between the old Adam nature and the new creation as a result of our rebirth of water and spirit. And he's there to help. And he will not permit anything from fulfilling the hope that we have, eternal life. Fellowship with him. The only way, brothers and sisters, our hope for the fulfillment of his promises, the only reason they won't be fulfilled is if we give up our hope. We live in the season of confirmation. And the Lord promises the confirmants. Nothing, nothing will happen in your life that makes it impossible for you to keep the vow that the confirmants make to the Lord on the day of their confirmation. Nothing. He will not allow anything to prevent us from fulfilling the promises we made to him. And so now we can go back to the Psalm 62. He only is my rock and my salvation. He is my defense. I shall not be moved. There was a sailor, a young sailor, and he was unfortunate enough to be on a boat that was shipwrecked, a ship that was shipwrecked. And so he was tossed into the ocean or to the seas, wherever it was, and he was able to swim to a rock. And he spent the night on that rock. And the next morning, by God's grace, he was rescued. And when he was rescued and was safe, he was interviewed. And he said, I spent the night on the rock. And I was shaking all night long from fear and from cold. But, he said, the rock never shook. And brothers and sisters, that's our God. 
He is there to defend us. He is there to protect us. He is there to watch over us. And he will not permit anything to allow the fulfillment of his promises to be frustrated. Nothing can separate us from the love of God. The Holy Spirit reminds us when the going gets tough, when we're battling against forces from outside or we're battling against our own Adam nature and the struggle seems so tough, we can read in 1 Corinthians in the second chapter, in the ninth verse, Eye has not seen, nor ear heard, nor entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. But then, the next verse, But God has revealed them to us through his Spirit. The Holy Spirit encourages us. The Holy Spirit reminds us. We may not be able to grasp it. We may not be able to understand it completely, what it means, what the Lord has prepared for us. But it is there, and the Holy Spirit reminds us, don't give up. Don't lose your hope, because you can have the confident expectation that the Lord will fulfill his promises. The apostle, or not the apostle, uh, the writer of Hebrews, whoever that writer was, he talks about hope and he calls it an anchor. And he says, he does, we, in the sixth chapter, the 11th verse, and we desire that each one of you show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope until the end. That you do not become sluggish, but imitate those through whom patience and faith inherit the promises. And then he describes this hope that we have as an anchor. It keeps us safe and secure in the storms of life. And it keeps us drifting away when things become so calm and so easy and so good and so sweet in life. Brothers and sisters, the power of hope, the power of God, the Lord will fulfill the promises he has made. The day will come when he will take his bride to him. The day will come when after the thousand year kingdom of peace and after the last judgment and the new heaven and the new earth is created that we will be in fellowship with the almighty God and he will be all in all. He will make it happen. And brothers and sisters, that is our hope. Let us not give up that hope, but rather let us stay diligent. Let us work strong. Let us remain faithful. Let us keep our hope alive. And then we can have the confident expectation that the Lord will fulfill all the promises he has made to us. Amen. This morning we have the opportunity to call on the District Evangelist Klein and ask him to serve us. song speaks of the Lord's presence. When the apostle spoke about hope, at least this, this human, this natural hope in our lives, that hope that seems to be the thing that maybe we use the most, unfortunately, 
Though certainly the, the definition that we hear the most, it's kind of weak. As he said, wishful thinking. But we heard about a very solid hope. A conviction. Something that we can absolutely hold on to. And that is our God. That is all that he offers to us and all that he provides for us. The apostle talked about all that the Lord has established for our salvation, for our ability to walk in harmony with him. Consider, brothers and sisters, what, what the Lord has established, what he's put into, into place for us, for our salvation. He's provided everything. He's provided it all. His son, the church, the ministry, the sacrament, the fellowship of brothers and sisters. And has not only given it and has not only established it, but continues to provide it. Nothing is held back. Nothing is missing. He's given it all. But now it comes down to the question, do I have hope in what he's given? Do I have that conviction that what he's provided and all that he's provided will establish me, establish us? That it will bring me up and bring us up into his image and likeness. That it will bring me ultimately to that perfect state of harmony with him. And it's more, brothers and sisters, than just our hope or belief. It must be our conviction, our absolute conviction that yes, with him, not only is it possible, but it will happen. He's convinced. He knows. Let us have that same hope, that same conviction that with him, that harmony will happen in us and with us. Amen. In this psalm, David is beset by problems. He is threatened by those who want to see him dead. And then he turns to the Lord and says again, My soul, wait silently for God alone, for my expectation is from him. He only is my rock and my salvation. He is my defense. I shall not be moved. He goes on to say, trust in him at all times. And that's the key, brothers and sisters. We come to the Lord for help. We come to the Lord so that we can live a life in harmony with him. We come to the Lord for the fulfillment of the promises as he's made. And in order to do that, we have to trust him. And then the other foot, we have to submit our will to him. In other words, obey. They're like the two shoes. And we even have a song, trust and obey. For there's no other way to be happy in Jesus, but to trust and obey. Those are the boots with which we march forward. Trust 
and obey. Trust and obey. We're now going to pray the Lord's Prayer. And then we'll hear the absolute confirmation that our repentant sins are forgiven. We conclude that Lord's Prayer with the words, for yours is the kingdom and the power. We pray that at the end of the prayer because everything that we've prayed before that prayer is dependent upon that that he is the kingdom and he is the power and he is the glory forever. No one else. He alone, he only is my rock and my salvation. Brothers and sisters, now, we pray that prayer. Let us put all of our heart soul, mind, and strength into it. And let us remember that the Lord is with us, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And they will fulfill the promises they've made. Let us keep our hope alive. Let us trust and obey the power of the Almighty God. In preparation for praying the Lord's Prayer, we have a hymn of repentance. <laughs> If you'll please rise, together we can pray the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, 
your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I now proclaim unto you the glad tidings, and in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God, your sins are forgiven, and the peace of the risen Lord Jesus abide with you. Amen. Loving and kind Heavenly Father, we come to you in humbleness, in reverence and adoration and in praise, in thanksgiving, you have forgiven our sins and told us so once again. Heavenly Father, you have promised us the kingdom. You have given, it is your good pleasure to give it to us. We just need to keep the hope alive. You can, you will fulfill your promises. And Father, help us to stay strong in faith. Help us to continue to look to you and only you. Heavenly Father, accept our thankfulness for what you have done and are doing and will do. Accept our thankfulness in our offerings. Accept our thankfulness, please, in the exercise of our gifts and talents to serve you and our fellow human beings. Please help us that we can share this wonderful promise with all of our neighbors and friends and family because they too can be part of that. You want all to be saved. Again, we ask for your blessing upon our mothers, whether they are here on this earth or have gone into the yonder realm. Again, we pray for those who are suffering, living through very hard and difficult, fearful and fretful times. Please, Heavenly Father, take away our fear and replace it with the confident expectation of the fulfillment of your promises to be with us always. Father, please send your son. Please accept us in your grace. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. a very blessed Mother's Day and all a very blessed week. Mm -hmm.